Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, a podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm an investigative journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are economists, scientists, politicians, academics and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and ecological crises that we face today. And they reveal their solutions to mitigate the damage to our future. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. This week I spoke with Joseph Mers, who founded the Mers Institute in response to the planetary crisis that we find ourselves in. Joseph is an entrepreneur. He set up a lot of businesses throughout his time. And through gathering data and seeing what was going on in the world, he decided that he simply had to be part of the solution. So the MERS Institute is very interesting. The programs that they're creating are unlike any I've seen before anywhere else. The programs are data driven and they're essentially trying to touch on different potential solutions to different part of the crises that we find ourselves in. And the program that we focused on today was Backfire, which is essentially using the tools of the advertising agency to create campaigns to impact huge social change. This is such a fascinating conversation because Joseph essentially says, we've run out of time to educate people. We've run out of time to raise awareness. The, the moment for that was in the 80s when climate scientists were shouting from the rooftops about what was going on. And because of the urgency of the situation that we find ourselves in, we need people to change now. And if we can use the tools of advertising, which are used to impact behavioral changes in order to engender profits for corporations, if we can use those same tools to bring about healthy changes in people, to bring about a higher quality of life and life satisfaction, whilst also mitigating the behaviors that essentially cause huge planetary problems, such as overconsumption or such as even overpopulation, he says, then we simply have to act now. Obviously, in the episode, we go into the ethics of this. Um, moving away from education and awareness is quite a scary idea, especially when you're trying to change the behaviors of people around the world. And one of the things that I bring up during the episode is this kind of, you know, villainous plot line of, oh, if this information or this tool fell into the wrong hands and he says well it is already in the wrong hands this is what advertising is it drives over consumption um, and we're simply trying to use the same tool to benefit the planet i so enjoyed speaking with joseph he is a deeply deeply concerned citizen he has brought together experts and scientists from all over the world to work on these programs and to work on backfire. The MERS Institute was also a founding partner of the Stable Planet Alliance. So there's a lot to think about in this episode, and I hope you enjoy it. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you love the episode, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where the interview transcripts are now available for patrons. The link is in the description box below, and a huge thank you to everyone who's already supporting the project. I was just <laughs> saying, there are so few organizations taking a novel approach to tackling these issues and it's quite remarkable really how we just are quite happy to go and put in all this work i mean you spoke to simon and even that you look at it's just so much focus getting getting everybody on this train and when we don't even take the time to check whether it's the right train to get everyone on that's uh, pretty worrying yes completely the that's sort of the theme that comes up in so many of my conversations. I don't think I've had somebody on to discuss carbon dioxide because the experts I'm speaking to are like, that's not the main issue. That's one, that's a very small part of the problem. <laughs> we spent a long time trying to sort of work out where to start. I think it took me about three years to find out where to start with these issues because they were just so huge. And, and at the end of the whole process, it was just very clear that it all came back to a behavioral problem. And I remember mm -hmm. talking to, I think it was Hugh Possingham, who's one of my advisors, about it. I rang him and I said, I think it's just a, it's just all stems back to behavioral issues. And he said that, I can't remember whether it was a government or a, some, some organization got him and a whole bunch of other scientists to spend a day together in a room on these issues i'm pretty sure it was Hugh. it might have been someone else but anyway and at the end of the day all they got to was that it was all a human behavior issue again so um which might seem obvious but 
I think all of this is obvious now, and for me anyway, in hindsight, I look back, I look back on it all, and I think, how did it take that long to get there? But mm. it's uh, just really complex. Yeah. Well, I think there is ugh, there needs to be a certain more awareness in the public dialogue of. And I really dislike using this phrase because it creates like a, a blameless sort of echo chamber um, whereby there's, you know, some power hungry elite that are doing what they want, like some sort of conspiracy theory. But nonetheless, there are powers that be uh, that benefit from the world being in this way and benefit from this sort of behavioral, um, what's the right word, maladaptations <laughs> that we've created as an industrialized modern society. Um, and so I saw something actually on Twitter just this morning, like the, somebody had created a thread about their disillusionment in government when they'd realized that, yes, government is letting this happen all over the world because it's beneficial to them on some level to those individuals. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the dialogue needs to be so much richer in terms of how to tackle the problem and what the problem really is, because I would agree with you that it is behavioral. Um, but that responsibility of changing our behavior goes all the way top and bottom. It's it's a symbiotic um, effect that needs to happen. Yeah, I I agree. I think the the worrying thing for me is is whether people. I I don't think we have much time at all. I, like I, mm -hmm. I genuinely, I'm, I mean, I'm probably sit in a pretty depressing camp. <laughs> as far as <laughs> where I think this is going, I think it's pretty, yeah. um, yeah, I, I, yeah, anyway, what I was going to say was because of the time constraints we have, I don't think we should go down the route of trying to make people aware and actually get them, uh, not everyone anyway. I, th I just don't think it's possible. I mean, I was reading a survey today from Ipsos where they found only 67% of 22,000 people surveyed thought that it was unlikely that aliens were going to visit Earth this year. So, <laughs> so <laughs> the remaining 33% thought it was either likely or didn't know. Um, and it was, and, and it was actually, you know, it was a pretty fair split between those two as well for the remaining 33%. Mm. So I, I think what I'm getting at is that I don't think we have time to bring everyone through the organic kind of understanding of what's happening and then rely on their perseverance and their dedication and their interest and all of these things that come into play for them to actually make the necessary behavioral change. Because we even know when it comes to behavioral change, even when people want to do it, how many people make, you know, New Year's resolutions and all these sorts mm. of things and then don't do them because it's hard. And that's kind of what that program's about, that backfire one that I, I mentioned to you about bypassing the entire understanding and education side and going straight for the behavioral change. Which is extremely difficult to do by bypassing the education part as well. Because I mean, normally behavioral changes, they take generations unless there's some kind of new technology that's introduced that improves the quality of life. And I think this is part of the equation that's so um, difficult. Like, in order to, the best way to enact change is to promise people something, right? That's how religions sort of take hold. Theologically, um, change your behavior and you'll get to the afterlife or whatever. There's been a lot of religion talk on the podcast recently. Um, it works. But if <laughs> it does work, it's, it's pretty scary. But if you're not, um, if there's no new piece of technology, whether it's actual physical technology or um, sociological technology, and you're asking people to change um, in a way that seems quite frightening to them without a guaranteed hope or a guaranteed better life afterwards, um, then I, yeah, I guess I struggle to see how you could do that without education. I think it it's it needs to be more of a subconscious thing. It needs to be something where you're almost fracturing society or creating a new version of society that people want to be a part of, whether that's a, a physical place or whether, I mean, unlikely to be. But um, even if it were, it were more virtual, or I'm not talking about metaverse, I know we've been seeing all that <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but basically... I mean, imagine if it was if it was suddenly popular to be to be poor or 
to be, um, you know, if, if, if suddenly those things were, were coveted in the same way it is being, you know, being mm-hmm. wealthy or having excessive amounts of things, that's what, that's what I'm talking about. And, and I'm talking about using the same tools that we know work with these things. I mean, if you look at the, the consumer psychology that happens um, by these commercial organizations and you look at the data and analytics that go into it and these people, the, the masses are being manipulated at a very kind of, mm-hmm. um, with very intricate tools um, into the desired behavioral change. And, and it's been so successful that it's actually created this, it's created the problem and, and, and mm-hmm. all of the issues that we face, well, pretty much all of the issues we face from environmental contaminants to um, even if you look at fertility issues and even if you look at population and, you know, a lot of that stems back to um, or stems stems from the success of the marketing and communications industry. So I think the tools are there and I think they can create the level of change that we need. They're just all funding in the wrong direction at the moment. But then if, okay, let's take your example. We make X popular, um, whether it's being poor or consuming less, unless you have the education behind that as well, which I understand we really are running out of time um, to give, then the danger is that when the next trend comes along, people will hop onto it. You know, like it, it still doesn't tackle the problem of having people disconnected from the natural world or deeply, deeply misunderstanding the impact that, that we have on the planet. And I think that's absolutely a spot on with that because it's, um, it's something that I was very concerned about in the beginning was that it's kind of just this superficial shift, right? You're moving a whole population into a place and they don't even deserve to be there. I mean, I look at this as from a species perspective right now, and I think we don't mm. even deserve to be here right now. We are a species that doesn't know how to exist in our natural state. Um, for the most part, um, we're, we're primates that are basically living in this self-created zoo. And, um, and, and I find that, uh, I find that terrifying, but, um, but the fact that, so I don't, you know, I, I think we don't, even at this point, we don't really deserve to be here. And I think if we were to artificially shift that in that same way, in the same fully superficial way that the, the advertising industry is doing, um, then we wouldn't deserve it even more. So what I, what I'm actually suggesting and what we've been looking into is how we can do that, but trigger some deeper sort of almost psychological positive feedback loop that people get such an immense amount of life satisfaction from as they as the term that they use in in um psychology circles is life satisfaction i mean probably a, a, the way that i would put it is more fulfillment like if we were to mm-hmm. be able to create because the the all of the advertising relies on creating the opposite um and so that's why i think we've got a real there are a number of of benefits that we have in our favor here. And they are the fact that, you know, the earth actually heals itself. I mean, that's incredible. Like all we have to do is stop doing the damage. Um, that's a huge thing in our favor. Another one is the fact that capitalism doesn't breed happy people. And I can say that firsthand I've made good amounts of money from it and, and beyond a certain point, it didn't make any impact on my happiness. So I think that's what we're aiming to try and um, exploit is how can we move people away from this unhappy state into something that they're not even going to want to look back at it anymore. They're not even going to want to. and, and, And maybe that involves some level of recognition of what's going on, although I'm not sure there's there's much value in that anyway, because you see the popularity of something like the social dilemma and, you know, people might Mm. go off Instagram for two weeks, but then they're right back on it. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, the neurochemistry of those things is just so addictive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, let's get into the, the background then of MERS before we get into crunching some of this data um, that you guys obviously have about advertising. Why, when and why did you set it up? Um, I set it up because oh, I, it started off as a conservation fund um, about, oh, I don't know how many years ago, a few years ago. And I was still living in the Blue Mountains in Australia at the time. And I very much miss the Blue Mountains. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I just wanted to, I'd, I'd already been well aware of the issues with the capitalist model for a long time and was trying to move, had been operating businesses in as ethical as possible, um, or as, as ethically as possible, I should say. Um, and then I just, I just felt like I, I couldn't do it anymore and I needed to, to actually be working on these issues. So I thought, well, I could start a, a fund and I could just put money into good, into good things. And I started doing that for, I don't know, a few weeks. And I just thought the problem is the money. I just hate money. And so <laughs> I then, um, which is an incredibly privileged thing to say, I realized, so I, you know, I just want to recognize that. Um, mm -hmm. I've got this psychologist who would say to me, you know, I can almost hear her in my ear saying, how dare you say that thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, um, yeah, I, I just realized that it was the money that I wanted to get away from is, is what I'm saying. And mm -hmm. so then it became, okay, well, what, what do I want to do? And, and, uh, then I spoke to you about Mike Joy and I remember after uh, Mike's one of the trustees for the Institute and one thing him and I have in common is that neither of us can stand working on the periphery of anything like we have to kind of be at the core of where the issue is and mm -hmm. and so that was when that pursuit um or the the focus became okay how do we get to the core of this and and it was just huge so yeah but that was when you guys landed on advertising as the core yeah, after a long time, and uh, well, consumption really consumption was, mm. and, and then and then that being just so efficiently driven. And my first organization that I started when I was in my teens actually was a marketing communications agency. So it was an industry that I was, you know, somewhat familiar with, and I still own a stake in a data and analytics company because I wanted to keep an eye on how that industry worked. And mm -hmm. it's yeah, interesting space. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Lots to learn <laughs> from it. <laughs> mm. All right. So you started up uh, the MERS Institute. You got your trustees together, decided to focus on consumption. And then what was it that led to the backfire problem? And can you give more detail on that for listeners? Yeah. So, um, well, the thing I wanted to do was in the beginning, I thought, look, I can either try and sift through all this data myself and find, you know, okay scientists and kind of just work through it um, and see what happens and take even more time. Or I can just go for the top scientists I can find in the world and just see what I can do. So mm -hmm. I tracked down the mobile number of all these fantastic scientists, the different mobile numbers, and I just called them straight out and just said, I'm doing this and would you want to be on my advisory board? And um, and they all said yes. So I was really fortunate. I mean, I told them what I mm. planned on doing and it was probably quite um, extreme. But um, so we we ended up with, um, well, Will Steffen's been on our advisory board for a long time. Um, Hugh Possingham, uh, Phoebe Barnard, a few others. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that allowed me to start to, to straight away get to the to the heart of the issues and try and start sort of working out where, um, what needed to happen. And one thing that became very clear very early on was this disconnect between information and behavioral change. And that, you know, there's lots of information out there and actually quite a lot of awareness too. Um, but, um, 
I don't think that I don't think information is always a good thing. I really don't. I think, um, yeah. So anyway, then there was that. The, 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 hang that on, kind of hang on, hang on. Let's stick on that. <laughs> Let's stick on that. <laughs> In what context is information not a good thing? Well, we're really complex beings, and um, and our perception is our reality, and our perception is formed through our experiences up to you know that point in time and um so you can't give one piece of information to 10 different people and they'll take it the same way at all and so i don't think i think one of the big problems we have in the world right now is the fact that information is so cheap and readily available and i mean i think there's lots of benefits to that and i'm not saying that we should stop it but it's it's brought about a huge amount of problems that I don't think we're ready to handle, and I, in honesty, I don't think we'll actually get through. So, um, does that make sense? Yeah, I would like to counter it though. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to, <laughs> um, because to me, one of the things that gives me hope about this very scary stage um, of our history is that there is so much information readily available. And of course, we all know that there are disinformation and misinformation campaigns and all this sort of stuff. But, you know, with the internet at your fingertips, um, it is possible to educate oneself. So I would counter that maybe information isn't necessarily the problem, but language is, how information is communicated. I mean, look at how what's coming out of the academy and unless you have a PhD or a master's in a topic, it's extremely dense. It's deliberate. It's deliberately kept within its ivory tower in order for mm. you know the authors to stay relevant and discuss it amongst one another. So I think it's how it's communication, how information is communicated, and um, what bits of it what are emphasized. You know, I'm, I'm a journalist. Like you can you swap out a few words in a headline, and you have a completely different story. If we had more journalists like you, then I don't think we'd have the problems that we have. But unfortunately, <laughs> we don't. Um, but yeah, I, I see what you mean, and I and I I kind of it's just it's I it's a very difficult route to go down to try and make change in people through information and rely on them to understand that i think even even if you were looking i mean if you look at the number of data points that are used in campaigns to make them efficient and effective um yeah you would have to write an article 5000 times in a whole lot of different variations I mean, maybe that, maybe the, the, maybe the future is some sort of journalism that knows you so well, it actually rewrites articles for you based on your, based on the data oh you have so you can understand God. it better. <laughs> oh um, my God, you've just blown my mind. <laughs> <laughs> that probably is the future. <laughs> it might be, it might be. I remember saying to my, my parents many, many years ago that I thought misinformation was going to be one of our biggest problems and we should st mm. launch businesses in misinformation because it's just, if you look at how rampant it is and anyway, I, my, my point is, I think, yeah, you, you're right. Language is a big part of it, but information as we have it at the moment, I think is a problem. Um, mm -hmm. and and I'm all for I'm I'm all for people being informed. I just don't think I don't know. There's some sort of global consciousness that's missing for it to be meaningful. Everything's so fractured, and I. But I don't think. I mean, I'm very pessimistic about about this whole thing, and I I know that we've got plenty of optimistic people within the institute or involved in the institute. Um, but I personally, based on the data and the whole point of the Institute in the beginning was to pull all the different scientific disciplines together mm -hmm. so that we could get a big picture. And I knew it was bad, but I just, I, I'm not, I don't think that we're going to get through this. I really don't. I, 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 I just don't. And that's me being honest. And I, so 
Well, yeah. I suppose it depends how we define getting through it because I also don't believe we're going to get through it. Um, but I do, and I'm actually, do you know, I'm so glad I have you on the show because I've been thinking so much about this question um, of advertising. And I've actually invited um, a really celebrated professor of marketing onto the show um, in the summer to discuss this. Like, oh, I cool. think a huge part of the problem is like the marketing behind climate change. Um, because I spoke with Jason Hickel, a, a degrowth scholar, and he was saying, you know, if we want to reduce consumption, we reduce um, working hours, we get people to spend more time at home with their families, making things with their hand, like a post-carbon world can be a happier world, it can be a better world, we can lift people out of poverty. And I think that this is the marketing message that is so missing uh, when we discuss climate change, the fact that it could offer everybody a better life, like we're not going to get through it. But whether we hit a state of collapse or whether we hit a state of adaptation that after a painful transition, surely, um, will lead to a greater source of satisfaction. Those options are still on the table and it baffles me why they're not being discussed more. Like we still, there's still an element of choice here. We can still choose the better option if we act very, very, very quickly. Mm. I, I agree with you from a marketing perspective that that's been mm -hmm. lacking, but I think we missed the boat 30 years ago. Like I really right. do. I think we, I, I just, I don't think we're going to be able to avoid a hothouse earth. And I think that most of us are going to see, and I hope I'm wrong. Like I would, mm. I mean, I would be the happiest person alive to be wrong on this because um, it's something that I've had to really come to terms with over the years, but I don't see us going through a small patch of, of difficulty at all. I think what's most likely to happen based on, um, the science that I have seen is, um, that it's just going to be one more event after another after another i mean people look at COVID and they think oh, i wish you know when's COVID over and we get back to normal and all of that sort of thing and what they don't see is that all of these are all of this is just part of a, a degradation that has been happening for a long time when you look at these freedom convoys and the mandates and i mean i still it's not it's and i'm not saying that one side is right at all because it's not it's it's I, i'm the first person to say that these it's just incredibly complicated. But I think all of these things that you see and all the crazy stuff that's happening is, is part of the collapse happening. I think we, you know, we sit there and we have this view of it happening. We wake up in the morning and suddenly everything's turned off. I, I don't think that's what's going to happen. Um, mm. So I, I don't think it's just... A, anyway, what I'm getting at... Sorry, I'm rambling. What I'm getting oh, at is that... I think this decline has been happening for a long time and it will mm -hmm. continue to happen until maybe there's some major collapse. But I don't, I, I think events have uh, gone faster than uh, the, 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 the issues in the earth system are, uh, ha we've pushed them beyond what we can survive, I think. And so, and so I think we're going to be looking at um, all of the tipping points going, and I and I, I mean, it's too hard to say how long there would be, but um, yeah, I think we I, I I don't hold much hope for us. We we we, we need to stay under one point five degrees, and that's just not. It's just not yeah. happening. It's just not going to yeah. happen at all. Yeah. There's some data to say that we we're already kind of locked into moving past it by 2015 i think it, i think it was so you know yeah i i can't remember um who it was on the show i think it might have been jesse she explained that um we're gonna overshoot 1.5 not because of continuing industries uh even even though obviously industries will continue but just from the damage already done like it's mm. all the the heat's already there and it's going to continue to exponentially grow even if we switched everything off tomorrow the overshoot's still there which i hadn't realized yeah. until speaking to her um can i ask you a personal question uh, yeah sure no no far away well i mean you're a father to to young kids right mm. how do you how do you deal with this on a personal level that is a very good question 
<laughs> um, it's, it's, it has not been, um, it hasn't been easy. And as much as I've kind of wanted to jump into these, the, you know, the, the almost tricking myself into believing that it's going to be okay. And it's, you know, we've got this and blah, blah, blah. I went through probably about nine months of depression a long time ago, I reckon five years ago or something when I realized what was actually happening. And, um, and then I thought that was it. And I thought I was kind of out the other side, but the other day it hit me that I haven't actually l looked forward. I, I suddenly remembered this feeling of thinking of looking back or looking forward, sorry, and actually being excited about something like in the future, like thinking, oh, that'd be nice if like, we, maybe we'll do that or, you know, mm. and it's sort of this, this almost nostalgic kind of feeling came back of when I used to do that all the time. And I realized that for five years or more, I have just not, um, I've had basically no hope, which was quite, quite interesting because I always thought I had hope. Um, but yeah, so I've been working to really come to terms with that without becoming a catastrophist or anything like that. Mm. And I don't, and I don't want to be that because there are variables, you know, there are a lot of variables in this. And as Will would be the first one to say, um, the earth system is the most complex system known to man. So Mm -hmm. What else is lurking there that might help us? We don't know. I mean, I was reading, I'm pretty sure I, I, I'm i right with my memory of this, but the ozone hole that we were, you know, so worried about has actually been contributing to cooling from my understanding. So, you know, okay. there are things that could work in our favor. Um, but yeah, all I do is just focus on the now really i think that's the only the only thing that's possible is oh, the only thing that's effective i should say is to is to bring myself back to the now and kids are really good at that they are always in the <laughs> now so they're always bringing me back to <laughs> um whatever's happening at that moment <laughs> yeah all right let's um get into the data of backfire then what is it that you guys are studying and what is it that you're trying to implement on what scale? Let's get into the nitty gritty. So we're looking at, um, at basically how we can use consumer psychology and data analytic and analytics, sorry, to, um, to, as I said, bypass all of the, uh, all of the educational and awareness side of making behavioral change and just triggering that change itself uh, on its own. And so we, I, I reached out to a very well-known consumer psychologist who is probably the best in the world at this, which I won't name for, um, yeah, it wouldn't be fair to him. Um, and, uh, I thought he was actually just going to hang up on me. So I, I rang him on his mobile and I said to him, you're probably going to hang up on me because I'm trying to bring about the demise of capitalism. But <laughs> he didn't. Um, he was very interested in it. Um, and a lot had changed since I was in that, uh, in that, in, in that world in the advertising, uh, industry. And obviously with the data and analytics company that I'm involved in that's different we've got data scientists and people like that working in that but in the ad industry he was telling me that it's changed and become so easy now to do this that you can basically put in the um the desired behavioral change and and then put it into this I'm assuming some kind of uh, platform online and it will just spit out all of the different things that you have to um, push in order to achieve that in different demographics. So, um, so anyway, there was there was some issues with being able to work directly with him, um, and but he's put us on to someone else who 
won't have the same issues um who he believes is just as good so um we're in the process of of that kind of getting them up to speed on what we're actually trying to do um so it's very early days the whole thing but we've got a really fantastic um experimental social psychologist as well who's been who i've just been talking to recently um and we've got a cognitive psychologist and a few this this it's been a very uh psychology heavy <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh last few kind of weeks but what is, what is it that you're trying to build are you trying to build an algorithm are you trying to build a platform no, so we're trying to build a series of campaigns. So um, right. over a period of over a number of years. So the idea would be to um, try and gradually almost create a pathway for a whole chunk of humanity to mm -hmm. out of this state um, and into some more fulfilled state or some way that we know that they're not going to be as susceptible to um to the way that marketing communications goes. And I mean, I know that sounds absolutely bonkers, but when you, Cambridge University's best plan at the moment is, um, is to refreeze the Arctic to buy themselves enough time to put huge, uh, huge emissions capturing technology or, or, uh, <laughs> out that doesn't even exist. I think the closest yeah. anyone's got to it, um, was some oil and gas company that they found out is is still emitting more carbon than yep. it's actually capturing. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. So I think we need to try. Um, at least we know that the technology works. Um, and yeah, so that's it. A series of basically a series of campaigns, and we've got we're, we're part of this um, the Stable Planet Alliance. Um, we were one of the founding organisations of that, which was. Uh, founded by Phoebe Barnard and a few others. Phoebe's the one who, who was the lead author on the scientist warning to um, scientist warning to action into action paper and the mm -hmm. um, one of the leads on the scientist warning to humanity paper. So that's with um, I, I, we, we spoke to Will about joining that and Will Stephens in the in the Stable Planet Alliance now too with Bill Reese, who was also mm -hmm. one of the authors of those papers. Um, and, and a number of others. And so we've kind of been talking to different, um, not specifically about this, but, uh, about different ways of approaching, um, funding for things like this. Cause obviously it takes a, like, it's going to take a lot of money, mm -hmm. much more money than anti-capitalist me has. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is a series of campaigns that's pushed out over a number of years and I'm assuming pushed out over social media, television, like the, the platforms where what the majority are in front of during the day? Yeah, so it would just be treated the exact same way as, as a commercial campaign. I think the, the key with this is that it's, I, I really think that it needs to be on a level playing field with commercial campaigns so that means if they're utilizing influences for some then you know it, it would it would be using all the tools that they have um and the only real difference is that a lot of not-for-profits have sort of well not a lot but some some not-for-profits have clicked to this kind of behavioral issue and they've started exploring you know using these tools but none of them that I have come across yet have actually moved away from the education awareness side because that affords you this huge amount of creativity that you don't have otherwise. Otherwise, you, you're stuck operating within the, you know, the constraints of, um, of educating people, basically. So yeah. um, the other huge benefit to this approach is that you can tackle topics that aren't even socially acceptable to discuss um, or like there what? might be like population for example um where it's you know you can't go out and say we should all have smaller families or how about one child or something like yeah. that um but through these sorts of things you can you can make that look more desirable um 
and without even having to use the word population. It's, it's, it's pretty, yeah, yeah. Um, it, oh, it's still, it's I still know, pretty it's scary. A mi- it, it's it's yeah. a minefield. It really is. But it it's, and I went through a massive ethical kind of thing with it. Yeah. And, um, but it's being done the opposite way to drive, uh, to drive us into mm. a place where where the planet is uninhabitable and humanity is facing extinction. Like, and it's, I know that sounds extreme to say, but it's, it's really true. And Mm -hmm. so I think not to mention the focus of this will be to create more fulfilled people. So you're almost, the way I see it is more, you're actually waking people up. You're, you're getting people out of a state of, um, a, a, an unnatural state that they're in. Now I oh, hang on, you have to counter you there. If you say you're bypassing education and awareness, then typically waking up is going from a state of unawareness to awareness. But if the if the education, if the information, if the why isn't a part of that, then are you really waking people up, or are you just changing their behaviour? Very good question. I think. <laughs> look, you're. Um, no, I, and I probably shouldn't have said it like that. What I mean is <laughs> they're, they're kind of sleepwalking at the moment in, in this infinite loop of consumption that is not only destroying the planet, it's making them miserable. And so by getting, what I mean by waking them up is I mean kind of getting them out of that, um, that state and into a place where they're healthier mentally and, um, and, thinking the right things i i mean you the right things i mean that's a minefield Mm. in itself but the it's a difficult situation and this is another thing that i think is really hard and i always say this to people you know there's no limit to the amount of suffering that humans can experience we can literally die in the most horrifically unimaginable ways and there's no limit to how fucked this can get. Sorry, I don't know whether I'm allowed to swear on this, but um, there really isn't. And so I think we need to acknowledge that and and realize that um, that it's not going to be pr- like it does. It there's nothing to say that this has this is going to be pretty or this has to be pretty or the solutions have to look perfect or and then they're not. And and as time has passed, that has got worse and worse and worse. And as more time passes, our solutions get worse and worse and worse as well. Or the options available to us. So, you know, right now. We might be able to use manipulative practices to bring population down. There might come a day where governments go, we don't even have time for that. And what's that going to look like? So, you know, it's a, Mm -hmm. um, it's really, it's a really difficult place to be. And it's one where that's got me personally questioning a lot from a philosophical perspective about what is it, what's even, why is it important to remain an extant species? Like, does it matter? <laughs> I think the other question that comes to mind, um, given what we've been discussing about information and education, is um, who makes the decisions about what behavioral changes need to be implemented? Because it, it creates a, a funnel, you know, where 1% of the population say, just to use the same uh, figure of wealth and equity, um, one percent of the population have access to information and impact the other ninety nine percent. And like, sure, you know, I can believe that um, your institute has like great intentions and it's data driven, and this is what like science is saying needs to happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I do trust that because I've interviewed some of your trustees. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's still a terrifying premise that mm. how do I put this? Oh, hang on. I need to think about it. <laughs> because I'm trying to think. I'm like, okay, okay. So, because obviously <laughs> it's like the beginning of a, of a Bond movie, isn't it? Um, you know, if this information or if this program fell into the wrong hands, but it is in the wrong hands. It's in the hands of the advertising industry already. That's the thing. We're not inventing anything new and we're not even using mm. it for 
evil. I mean, we're actually using it in probably the best <laughs> yeah. way that it can be used. But I, but I completely agree with you. And, you know, I think that's one of the hard things with this. And this is a process that I have absolutely gone through over and over. My father was was a, a monk for six and a half years before he met my mother. So we grew up with wow. philosophy and theology drilled into us mm. every day. And sometimes I think about, sometimes it's, you know, it was definitely too much. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's made me think a lot about everything that I do and, the, you know, the, the potential repercussions, negative and positive. Um, and I think um, it's either, it's, it's literally either this or, I mean, this is the heart, this is as close to the heart of the problem as you can get as far as I'm concerned. And it is the only viable solution that I think is actually known at the moment. I, I, and I, mm. that might sound, you know, arrogant or and maybe it's total naivety on my part and if anyone knows of anything better i would love to hear it because i'd love to throw energy behind it um mm -hmm. but i think in the time frame we have available to even try and make change for the when you've got to weigh up the likelihood of success and the efficacy of what you're doing and the potential negative side effects um this is up there with you know this is uh, this is this has got to be one of the best ranking things that i've seen i mean this is a question that comes up time and time again on this show like how do we get people to change whether and how do we get people but the, yeah i mean this is the thing you know it's like how do you get people in power to change as well because we've seen you know huge swaths of populations um, modify their behavior, oftentimes in the wrong way. Like the whole plastic bag versus paper bag thing, it drives me mad <laughs> because the life cycle analysis of a plastic, a single use plastic bag is the most efficient and beneficial to yep. the planet. Da 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 da. It's like people are um, uh, capable of change. Certainly, if they're in that kind of position, say typically like middle class, where life is not so precarious that they have time to think about what needs to change and they have time to process information. Yeah then education yeah. is key at that point. Yeah. But still, nonetheless, um, people can, you know, huge, the entire population almost could change their consumption habits. And it still has such a little impact in comparison to like conglomerates, multinational corporations, and the planet's wealthiest people who use an insane amount of resources, you know? Mm. So like, how, mm. how do you, like, with this, will this program get to them? Will it encourage them to maybe change their business models, their business styles, what it is that they want to achieve? You know, the need for profit? Because, I mean, at, at this point in capitalism, in late-stage capitalism, the vast majority of us are just rats on the wheel without yeah. much choice. Yeah. There's still a, a good portion of wealthy people who are who have a significant impact on the planet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as far as the the kind of the one percent or um, yeah, I mean we haven't th there hasn't been an objective to kind of target them specifically or anything like that, and I I don't. Um, I never really found it the uh, I don't know I never really found it a compelling approach I, I I know it makes sense from an energy perspective like you know put all your energy into such a small number of uh, so few and you could have a you know have a big impact with that but I just don't I think that's where when you're weighing up the likelihood of success versus the um the efficacy, seeing where something would plot on that graph. I, I don't think it would plot too well if it were just targeting those people because there's too much, there's too much going on. But in saying that, some of them, some of them do understand, um, these issues and want to do things about it, but they can't, we've, we've been told 
um, through some of these organizations that we work with that, um, that a lot of high net worth individuals want to do things to counter a lot of this. Um, but they don't want to get involved with, from a uh, publicity perspective, um, topics that they classify as um, not socially acceptable. So, I mean, I always think the the annoying, I, I remember one day I saw that, the the Bezos Earth Fund website and then Amazon, and you just think you're literally mm. just destroying with one hand mm. and then like giving back mm. a fraction of it with the other to try mm. and what, to try and. That's just PR. It is. Yeah, it is. But I don't even think I want to put any energy into people like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. And I think, I think what's quite nice about your vision is that it kind of leans into democracy as well. Like if you get the majority on board, then governments and, will ha and institutions will have to follow. Otherwise they'll lose their consumers. They'll lose, you know, the respect of their democratic citizens. They'll, lo they'll lose votes. There we go. There was, there was definitely, a, a um, that was definitely one of the considerations in the beginning was trying to, you know, that, that they'll follow where the consumers are. And that's, that's something that, um, one of these ad guys was talking to me about, um, well, that particular one, he was, he was saying how they've been working on this idea and I hope I'm allowed to say it on here, but anyway, um, they'd been working on this idea of trying to get consumers to pay more for the emotional side of, of whatever they're purchasing. So uh, basically like, I guess extended out to kind of the most extreme version, you wouldn't even be buying physical goods. A lot of the time you'd just be buying an emotional connection to the brand basically. Um, and that was their way of trying to, trying to tackle because he was very aware of the issues that were going on and was wanting to try and um, do something about them. And I think, you know, that it's really nice. It was really nice to hear that they'd even been thinking of it. And I think something like that, I mean, they'd be the ones who could make it work if anyone could. And I could see something like that working, actually. Um, but again, I just don't think there's any sort of silver bullet. I mean, that sounds, I don't know what, which brand discussing there but that sounds dangerous from a longer term perspective where you're asking people to buy to emotionally invest and pay a fiscal investment to match that emotional investment then it buys into that sunken cost fallacy doesn't it where people will keep investing in that thing especially if they have an emotional tie no matter what happens or no matter what that brand is then doing you mm. know like over a longer term yeah, okay, we're asking them to just support us a little bit financially um, without having to send them a product. But eventually you're going to be able to douse them in product. Yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 I think where it, wherever you kind of tease these situations out from here to try and see a likely future, there are no good ones. I yeah. haven't been able to find any good ones. And even if we achieve this, I'm not saying that like the, the, the whole objective of this program is basically the science might be wrong. So we might have more time. Um, sorry, not the objective, but the whole idea behind it is mm. the science might be wrong. We might have more time than we think, in which case we should do everything we can anyway. Um, and, um, if that's the case, then what I was hoping that this would achieve if it worked would be just to buy enough time to take the pressure off the earth system for um, people to organically understand the problem and actually shift consciously into the right place. But um, there's, I, I don't think there's any way of doing that with the time that we have. Is, and I've said that many times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this I think I think it, uh, I think what you're proposing makes sense, um, and I'm thinking uh, I cannot now for the life of me remember uh, any actual concrete details. But there is that in in psychology, 
there is that relationship between body and mind whereby the more the more that you practice a thing the more it becomes real um so i mean this is why faith based teachings often have these ritualistic um daily habits you know so it ingrains the faith more and more so if you get people to impact their behavior then gradually they might come to understand that behavior through the act of practicing it um mm-hmm. perhaps over a generation so there is still access to that education and awareness which i'm very keen on <laughs> perhaps further down the line well that that's very much where i think it needs to be i'm not saying we should get rid of it completely because then i think we do just mm. end up at a zombie you know what's the point anyway just being it's pretty much the same as it is now um so um i i i i want the world to know why they're doing these things it's it really is that time constraint that's the only reason why yeah. it ever was considered being removed understood i suppose actually one key question um would be which changes do you want to affect which behavioral changes that again is a very good question and that's something that we've been probably most of the time has been spent on actually trying to work that out because it's um it's it's really like i think that's going to take a long time to even be able to answer that properly the closest we've got so far is um is to just increase life satisfaction or fulfillment um and that might mean you know a good example of that would be um if you if if the data said that to do that we would you know people would get that from volunteering for example then you know the campaigns would be trying to get more people volunteering or so you know they i mean that's a very a very rudimentary way of putting it a rough way of putting it but um that's kind of the thinking behind it but the closest yeah the closest I've been able to get so far has been fulfillment because that's really what's exploited by the ad industry for consumption. How do you measure what fulfillment is or could be? I'm not sure get quantifying a lot of this as well has been something that we've been working on. Some of it will come from the tried and tested ways that the ad industry uses for for quantifying things um but yeah i'm i'm not sure until we until we actually know 100% the things that we're going to be driving and they'll probably be different in different demographics too it will really come back to what the data is telling us to do and we haven't even got that far yet the the program it was an idea of mine i had probably about 5 years ago or something and it sort of just bounced around in my mind until a few months ago when i thought okay we need to start doing this and we've made pretty good traction in that time but it is huge so I've, i'm not sure when we'll have more clarity around this <laughs> <laughs> well once you do once the program's maybe up and running or you find some key stuff let's get you back on the show to discuss it because it really is a fascinating proposition Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. I I am concerned as you say about the ethical side, but mm. um we'll see how that how that works out too. <laughs> but the, it, it's funny because that the the reason I decided to move on it at this point in time or well, one of the the main reasons was because of this other program that we'd launched which was called Discover Success and it was about trying to get people to um to consider what success was to them to actually just think about it and so we invited a whole lot of people to come in to sit down with a, with this organizational psychologist regularly and just have a conversation about what success meant to them mm. and it was the rate of change in that that made me go right we need we need to kind of cut out that organic process if we're going to because it was and also only it was really only people who had like you know they had the interest in it they had the understanding yeah. they had the perseverance yeah. they had like all these things yeah that's part of the problem so my final question for you then joseph is who would you like to platform the theme that i really wanted to get onto was energy and the best person to talk well i mean i know you've had nate on there and um mm. but 
uh yeah mike joy i would say mike joy i don't know whether you've reached out to mike yeah um we're setting up for when he's back on land yes he's out at sea at the moment <laughs> i'm getting these intermittent emails sorry all i could find on my phone <laughs> <laughs> excellent joseph thank you so much for your time it was a real pleasure speaking with you nice to talk to you thanks if you want to learn more about the murray's institute i've put links in the description box below Remember to subscribe to this channel and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon. The link is in the description box below, and that's also where you'll get access to the interview transcripts. A huge thank you to the Planet Critical patrons and supporters. This work wouldn't be possible without you. Thank you all for listening. See you next week.